Hello and welcome to Lost in Sci-Fi and Fantasy. I'm your host Leo, and today we are talking Singing in the Rain, the classic 1950s musical about the end of the silent era of film. Or at least that's kind of the overarching plot. So this film is, well, I feel, a very good representation and a little bit of a love letter to the silent era of films, or at least the end of the silent era of films, as it's willing to show some of the kind of glamour of that era, while also poke at least a good amount of fun at it as well. Now, you also might be wondering, why am I talking about this, a, a musical from the 50s about the end of the silent era of film? And I, I just think that it's a neat movie. I really like it. I do enjoy the occasional uh, 50s, 60s-ish musical. Uh, it's a family tradition in my house that we watch um, White Christmas uh, around Christmas time. And, yeah, that's... I just really like these kinds of musicals. They're they're pretty fun. And I even like modern interpretations of these musicals as well. For example, I prefer the more modern Broadway version of Holiday Inn to the original version of Holiday Inn. Because you can feel the dread and annoyance in in the performance of of uh of the main character. And I, I really enjoy that. But we're not talking Holiday Inn. We're talking Singing in the Rain. So the plot for this movie is relatively simple-ish to sum up. It's kind of split into two main plots. The romance plot and then the overarching plot. And that's kind of how a lot of these musicals are kind of split up. Is the plot that focuses around the romance and how they get to know each other and how they're introduced... And then the plot that the movie's technically about that, you know, is the overarching driving force for the film. So the main overarching plot is the studio, Major Motion Pictures, I think is what the studio's called, is, or it's Monumental Studios, I think it is. They are falling behind. The... Warner Brothers Studios have released The Jazz Singer, and it is doing gangbusters. And they had just released their most recent film, which was a silent film, and it did well. But now that there is... The Jazz Singer has been released, things are kind of starting to shift. People love being able to hear the actors and whatnot, they are then faced with a challenge. Do they make their latest film a talkie, or do they try to stick with their guns? Well, because of how popular the jazz singer was, they decide to try and adapt their plot to a talkie. But they don't fully understand how to get it to work. And the actors are having trouble transitioning into that. They have to go through elocution lessons to or diction lessons in order to pronounce things more robustly with rolling Rs and whatnot. But while one of the actors is able to do it fine, the other one, the actress, is not. One, she has, you know, the stereotypical New york -y accent kind of thing, and she is either not able or not willing to give it up. And so there's there's that barrier of, of her pronunciation and her accent being quite thick. Then there is the other issue of technical problems, where they are trying to get her to speak into the microphone, but they can't quite get her to do that because, you know, she's used to moving around and being, you know, able to pantomime acting and whatnot. But because the microphone has to be set in one place, they need her to speak into the microphone, which at first they hide in a bush, then they hide it in her dress, but in the dress they hear her heartbeat, so they hide it on her shoulder. 
And because she still continues to move, she'll fade in and out of range of the microphone. They also run into a lot of technical difficulties, such as the fact that now all of their props are extremely loud and his costume is extremely loud and, like, you can hear it, like, rubbing. So they, in the preview, are shown to be kind of a laughing stock and that it's, they, they are not able to make the transition. So while they think about it, this is kind of where the main plot and the romance plot kind of intersect towards the end of the film is that they figure let's change it into a musical because then we could do some singing and dancing numbers which the main actor Don Lockwood is really good at and they would be able to kind of dub over the main film add in dance numbers as well as some songs and bing bang boom we're able to potentially save the film. Plus add in a bit of a convoluted plot about a dancing man who gets bonked on the head and ends up in revolutionary France. And boom, you you can do modern numbers and dances along with more period numbers and dances. Yay. So, there we go. But there's another issue. The actress, Lena Lamont, one, she can't act. She can't dance, and she can't sing. So they have to try and work around her. The way that they've decided to do this is to dub over her. Use Kathy, who Dawn has fallen in love with, and use her voice instead in order to kind of try and trick the audience into thinking that Lena Lamont can sing. But afterwards, you know, she would have full credit and everything. But when Lena learns of this, she goes immediately into sabotage mode, forcing the studio to scrub her name from the thing and make it seem like Lena did do the singing and whatnot for the film. Singing and speaking for the film. But in order to thwart this, they force Kathy to sing for Lena once more, but reveal that it is her singing for Lena and boom that's kind of the end of the the main plot the romance plot is kind of following Dawn well it it's kind of starts when Dawn is trying to escape a pack of ravenous fans he climbs over onto a tram and then jumps into her car for a little meet cute where she thinks that he is a criminal and gets the attention of a police officer who lets her know this is the biggest star in Hollywood at the moment. Like, if anything, you're lucky. Now, he does take some advantage of this situation and immediately tries to hit on her, but she brushes him off and pretty much insults him to kind of get him to back down by saying that... He, what he's doing isn't acting. She's an actress. She's going to be on the stage and her name's going to be known around the world. Because, you know, what he's doing is more pantomime. But, once she drops him off at his destination, she goes and it turns out that she is a cake dancer. So, I, the studio hired her and her troupe to pop out of a cake and dance. Now, of course, he pokes fun at this too much, causing her great embarrassment to where she goes to throw a pie in his face but ends up accidentally pieing Lena Lamont, who gets her fired and pretty much forces her out of potential show business. Except for weeks later, she does kind of resurface. Now, Dawn spends weeks trying to find her to apologize and, you know, set things right and potentially get her cast in something, but doesn't have any luck. Then she ends up actually in a bit part in a film and gets noticed by the producer of the company and has her cast in a bit of a bigger role in a different film. 
she initially is going to turn it down after it's discovered who she is and what she did. But Dawn insists that the producer, you know, still cast her in that role to help her have some upward mobility. Then, after this encounter, he professes his love for her and they, I guess, start dating on the down low. But they do have to keep it a bit secret because there's the weird publicity thing where people think that him and Ms. Lamont are dating and... If she is spotted by Ms. Lamont on set, it's going to become a big old mess. And they don't want to deal with that. So they continue in secret until the release of, or at least the preview of the film. At which they then retire to his mansion where he is very distraught. And they come up with the idea to make it a musical first. Then they come up with the idea to dub over Lena with Kathy and they grow closer while doing this and he has big aspirations to show her off to the world and announce to everyone that they are dating screw the publicity with Lena screw Lena in general let's do like let's you know be happy essentially now this works out until one of the actresses from Kathy's other film kind of blabs the whole idea to Lena, who then, like I said earlier, forces the studio to kind of take her name off, take Kathy's name off the film, and try to force her to be Lena's voice permanently. Now, initially, it seems that everyone is on Kathy's side, but then when the guys come up with the idea to pull a switcheroo they force Kathy to be the voice where she kind of breaks up with Dawn and says fine because she's under contract and does the performance and then they reveal that she is the one singing she runs off in embarrassment but he has them has the crowd stop her points out that she is the one that was singing the entire time during the film and kind of makes the big announcement through song that they are dating and what's not. Pretty much professes his love, love for her uh, to everyone in the audience. And that is overall the film. It's quite good. There are some very good numbers. There are some numbers that, upon reflection, aren't as good as they used to be. The song Make Them Laugh, overall... I, I used to love, but mostly because it's pretty much a song that's just about slapstick. And at the time, it was quite funny when I was a kid. But as time has gone on, it kind of drags on a bit long as a song. Yeah, the I, I, I'm not a big fan of how he'll start singing and then just kind of mumble away because he's doing a bit. So it becomes very unfunny because he's he's kind of killing the song. <laughs> But overall, like, as a display of slapstick comedy, it is a really good, you know, example of slapstick comedy. With, of course, the cul culmination of the three backflips, or technically two and a half backflips, that ends with him going through some drywall. Peak comedy. There are some editing issues with the film. Like, at one point, it just kind of hard cuts into a, a different bit or it will cut from one th scene like one shot in a scene to another shot in a scene and people will change position and uh posture it, it, it can get a little bit messy at times but i won't fault too much for that uh the i think the worst part of the film is the random extended dance sequence that goes on for, like, way too long. Anywhere from five to ten minutes. But it just goes. And it is the Broadway melody. It goes. Overall, it's a, an, an interesting sequence. But the setup for it is after they talk to the producer and say, Hey, this is our idea to turn it into a musical they kind of go into like an idea for like after they 
started doing it and they got most of it done, they're like, okay, so what's left? And Don's like, oh, we just have like one scene left and it's pretty much like the introductory scene following this, you know, guy who is trying to get into the scene and his meteoric rise to fame before, you know, going into the period piece. And it is a really long sequence. And it does tell an entire story within it, which is nice. Though it doesn't quite lead into the the bit that it's supposed to. And it just goes on for a really long time. Pretty much, he, like, he gives a short description of the scene. Then it goes into the scene. And you kind of think, oh, you know, they're, they're shooting it. And then it ends with, and that's pretty much what I'm thinking. And the producer's like, eh, I don't know. I'll have to see it on film. And the other guy's like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, it'll look even better on film. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it looked fine. But boy, howdy, was it long and a little bit drawn out. There are some kind of nice touches that are sprinkled throughout the film. Like at the very beginning of the film, when Don is kind of giving his backstory, what he is saying is kind of the mythologized, uh, the mythical version of his his rise. But what we are shown is what actually happened. So while he's talking about him and his friend, you know, going to this school and learning from the best, it's showing that they started out just kind of dancing in a bar for pocket change, sneaking into movies and whatnot as kids to them then doing just kind of bit gigs here and there playing music and singing then they kind of started a small vaudeville-esque uh, comedy act and they slowly but surely worked their way up to slightly bigger and bigger crowds until they kind of just snuck their way into monument pictures and they they started out in the music department. Then Don was able to kind of convince a director to let him take over the stunts because their stunt guy got knocked out and didn't perform the stunt the way the director wanted. So he's like, oh, I think I could do that. So he does it and gets hired on to become a stuntman. And he started pretty much becoming the stuntman for every film. So, like... All of the stunts he would perform. And from that he got the attention of the producer. Who decided to give him a chance at actually acting. And since it was silent film. It was you know. Very much just gestures and whatnot. So it worked out pretty fine. And he was able to do a lot of good. You know. Fight choreography. And the fight choreography that we see for one of the films. Uh, at the very beginning. Is very cool and interesting and looked very fun. But, you know, of course with the transition, he he has his style that he used during the silent films. Where, like, he would just say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. But that doesn't translate as well into film because, well, all you're doing is repeating a line. Like, you know, they can make changes to the dialogue that you're saying in a silent film because they'll like, cut out most of the words you're doing. Or if they do anything, it'll just come off as just like a single I love you. That kind of thing. But when it's put to audio, it sounds like garbage. But he is able to adapt to the whole audio thing a bit better, especially when he is convinced to pretty much go back to his vaudevillian roots and sing and dance through it. And of course, like, this pops in every so often. For example, during the uh, diction lessons, him and his friend pretty much clown on the teacher and do a whole tap routine around him, just messing with him. Yes, this, this is one of my favorites. It's not my favorite favorite. I would have to say I prefer stuff like uh, White Christmas... Or Slipper in the Rose is probably uh, up there as one of my favorites. Just because there's so many more... Th there's more interesting dance sequences in Slipper in the Rose than, say, Singing in the Rain. 
Because, sure, there are some really good dance sequences in Singing in the Rain. Some of them just are, like, light tapping here and there, but... Eh. Where in Slipper in the Rose, and I'll probably talk about Slipper in the Rose at some point if I haven't already. I don't think I have. There's a fantastic sequence where it's an extended dance sequence, as happens in a lot of musicals. And what's happening is they are dancing on this railing and a guy is throwing plates at someone who's like balancing on this railing who then catches each of them, then walks along the railing and then breaks into a tap on the railing and it's very cool and very fun. I highly recommend you check it out if you get the chance. As for this film, I also highly recommend that you check it out. It is a very fun film, and it can give you a little bit of a look into... like, uh, Of course, a more satirical, jokey look, but a little bit of a look into the whole transition from the silent era of film into the speaking era of film. Uh, something else that's a little bit weird in this film is Gene Kelly looks directly into the camera so many times, and I believe that's on purpose because it's supposed to be he's a silent film actor in this film. So that's kind of a whole thing, is that you're supposed to kind of look into the camera and like show off your expression and your face and whatnot. And yeah, it, it's just, there's a lot of shots of just his face. He's He's mugging it a lot. But yeah, so I decided to pair this film with The Great Dictator because I felt that they were kind of thematically kind of related. One in the plot of the film and the other in the kind of context of the film. So this film was made in the 50s, about the 20s, and The Great Dictator is a movie in the 40s, or set around the 40s, specifically, actually, technically, more roundish the 30s-ish. But The Great Dictator it was Charlie Chaplin's first speaking film. It is what I'm kind of saying is was the final nail in the coffin for silent film. Because he was kind of the last holdout for that era of film, and he had he was like the last guy still doing silent films well into this era. And finally, he did a speaking film. He felt that the story and whatnot was strong enough that it needed him to actually speak. And I I kind of agree. Now, of course, it is a comedy. It's, a, it's called a black comedy because... It's kind of dark humor. It is a movie pretty much describing the rise of Nazis around World War II. And it's kind of a Prince and the Popper situation where he just so happens to kind of look like the dictator. So he ends up just kind of becoming the dictator and tries to maneuver it in such a way to to make it a better outcome. But yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that more in the next episode, but I felt that, one, that it's a very important and interesting film, and I want to talk about it. Especially since uh, my history with that is I, a film class. <laughs> yeah, I took a film studies class, and that was one of the films we watched. And I would like to talk about it. But it also kind of works in this weird kind of going backwards in time thing, because the movie I'm going to do after that is the original 1933 King Kong and I do look forward to talking about that as well. And watching it for the first time, because I've never seen the original. But after that, we're going to kind of... We're going to do My Adventures of Superman, and then I have some plans for the end of the month, then going into October, where we're going to do some some spooky things. And that's going to be a good old fun time. Now, I think that's actually it for this episode. It's going to be a bit of a short one, because it is a fairly simple plot, but 
it is a very fun film, and I do highly recommend it for anyone who at least has a passing fancy for uh, musicals, or in this case, it's it's a light musical, as it only has, like, a handful of songs, really. But, yeah. <laughs> With that said, though, thank you guys so much for listening. If you guys liked this and you are listening on YouTube, feel free to give it a like, comment, and subscribe. Or if you are listening on any podcast catcher of your choice, feel free to rate, review, and share it with your friends. Once again, thank you guys so much for listening. I will talk to you guys next week. Goodbye.